you know, in the Western media, the prevalent view is China managed COVID terribly. Uh, there was confusion, there was overreaction, people oppressed, and so on. In fact, China did extremely well. While the rest of the world uh, was paralyzed, the Chinese economy continued to function. Uh, according to the WHO, per million, China had one of the fewest deaths in the world. For most of the world, we were at home, uh, working or pretending to work, and looking forward to the parcels that came through our doors and opening the boxes, and sometimes forgetting what we had ordered a few days ago. But usually with delight to find that, well, these are things we wanted. Well, who made the stuff in the boxes? They were all made in China. And that was at the heart of the supply chain crisis. China was producing for the entire world during that period. And all the ships were pulled to Chinese ports. I was in logistics. And the freight rates rose steadily from 1,000 to, to, to West Coast US to Europe, 1,005, 2,000. And the ships were told, do not uh, take on cargo. The moment you unload the containers, come back, come back. Then when rates reached $5,000, they were told, leave the boxes there because the cost of a box is only $2,000. The critical deficiency were ships. And of course, in other parts of the world, rates went up because the ships were no longer there. In 2002, when Omicron appeared, the Chinese were, were not sure what it meant, because in Hong Kong there were many deaths. It turned out later that the deaths were mostly due to Delta, not Omicron. Then the 20th Party Congress was coming up. And the 20th Party Congress in the Chinese Communist Party is as important as the paper conclave. So they had to, for their own legitimacy, make sure that when the votes were counted, the hall was full. They were able to contain Omicron in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, but in Shanghai, because the Shanghainese thought they were superior and had better methods. It got out of control. The vice premier went down, Sun Tun Lan, and told the party secretary, who is now the premier of China, he said, you stop it. The Shanghainese were traumatized. For two, three months, they were, they were in jail, regardless of what they were doing. You know, my Chinese friends outside Shanghai laugh at the Shanghainese. You see, they had to come up and because they've always had a superior attitude towards Chinese from other parts of China. But just to give you a sense of how much China moved ahead, in 2021, China's merchandise trade surplus was $520 billion. In 20 2020, in 2021, it went up to $670 billion. In 2022, when the rest of us thought that China was in turmoil, the merchandise trade surplus went up to $870 billion. Now in Europe, America, Japan, the printing presses were working 24-7 to provide the money supply, which kept us all fed. And life was normal, apart from physical deprivation of movement. But the guy beavering away the corner, he was collecting all that money. And that's why Chinese money is now flowing out to buy assets in the world. In, China, in Singapore, we got a trickle is causing terrible asset inflation. Three-star restaurants have booked months in advance. Golf club memberships have doubled in Sentosa. 
the queue for Porsches, Lamborghinis, Bentleys, Rolls Royces in the months if you know the dealer. They've always understood pandemics. In their recorded history, there were over 350 pandemics going back to the period of the Warring States. On every pandemic or epidemic, they had detailed records. Symptoms, progression, the remedies which were helpful, and so on. And the only assured way of controlling a pandemic is to lock down, mathematically you reduce the coefficient to below one. So the old imperial capitals of Luoyang and Chang'an, which is now Xi'an, they were divided into cells. In an emergency, whether it is a threat of insurrection, an assassination attempt, fugitives to be, to be caught, they would seal the cells. Then cell by cell, they would check. And in the palace itself, in the imperial harem, because the emperor would have many wives and many sons from different wives, it was critical that in the pandemic, they don't lose all the sons. If they lose all the sons, then the dynasty ends. So they have locked down procedures in the harem. And every dynasty would have to go through five to 10 epidemics. There was nothing new to them. So when COVID struck, they knew what was the ultimate solution. Now for Chinese people, they may complain, they may cry blue murder like the Shanghainese did, but in the end they comply. Because it's socialized into the political culture, into the social instinct. But the foreigners were there, like the Europeans, they couldn't take it. <laughs> they left, they left, they couldn't take it. Because Chinese culture has its own quality. And it's, it goes back a long time, without a break. When Europe was united under Rome, Republican and Imperial Rome, China was unified. But Chinese unification was based upon a historical, cultural, and philosophical inheritance which went back 2,000 years before then. Whereas when Rome was established, there was no such common philosophical basis in Europe. So you had Roman law. The first dynasty in China ruled by law. They were the legalists. It was so tough, the Chinese people couldn't take it. So after the first emperor established it by will, by force, his son could not carry on. And the next dynasty, the Han dynasty, decided you cannot use legalism to unify such a big country. You needed a moral code of conduct, which the Chinese called Li. And that while, I remember reading Joseph Needham, while in China's history, there was a bigger corpus, bigger corpus of legislation than in European history. In the Chinese tradition, at the top, it is not law. It is not la lege e vigali patuti. It is at the top. If the law results in an absurd outcome, then propriety takes over. This is Chinese thinking. Yes, never changed. And even in Singapore, which is three quarters Chinese, and we've inherited institutions from the British, people always feel that if you want to help, you can help. You should be flexible if the legal outcome is somehow perverse or not quite right. And the continuity of Chinese culture has created a larger nationality than any other by a long stretch in human history. No other nationality, no other race has as many members as Chinese people. Hey, Europe is, is diverse. Europe is interesting precisely because it's, it's diverse. I was in Spain, now I'm here. Uh, Alex from Finland, 
I have Norwegian friends, Greek friends, Croatian friends. Europe is a collection of tribal nations. Yes, there is a common civilizational basis in Greece, Rome, and Judeo-Christianity. But the European people feel passionately their own individual identities. But for China, there's no such diversity because they had paper. They had paper as a monopoly for over 700 years. Now, paper as a form of storage, as a means to process information, is orders of magnitude greater than parchment or papyrus. So if you compare Han Dynasty records with Roman records, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. And it became the tradition in China that every dynasty will write the history of the previous dynasty. So today in China, there are 23 official dynasties. The last was of the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. The history of the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1911, is today being written. The exercise began in 2003 and was launched by uh, Vice Premier Li Lanqing, whom I knew as Trade Minister. And I remember him telling the scholars, do not rush to conclusion. Do not rush to conclusion. And at that time, they were thinking of 99 volumes with five volumes on the foreign missions operating in China, like the Jesuits, the MEP, and so on. Then it became 250 volumes. I think it's gone beyond that. There's more material on the Qing Dynasty than on all the previous dynasties combined, both internal records, provincial records, and foreign records. So paper enabled the development of an information-intensive society. So they were the first to record Halley's comment. They recorded flood levels going back over 2,000 years. If you go to Chengdu, Joseph Needham wrote about it at Tu Yanjiang. The same irrigation system developed over 2,000 years ago continues to operate, continues to keep Chengdu supplied with water and free of floods. Climate records, grain, and who were the programmers of that period? They were the scholars, because it took years for them to understand the language, to write it with a brush, and you can, on a brush, on rice paper, write much more, much more quickly than monks could in the Benedictine monastery. I was just at Montserrat a few days ago and had a wonderful briefing about how the Benedictines kept records for the church, for Europe, for centuries. And in Switzerland, in places like St. Gallen, less ravaged by war, the most complete records of the period of that history. In the 8th century, the Chinese army in Central Asia was defeated by the Abbasids. And among the Chinese prisoners of war were a few who knew how to make paper. And so paper mills were established in Samarkand, Bukhara, Damascus back then and Islamic civilization went through a transformation in the script and in the thinking, because then they had knowledge. So we had Avicenna and all the, the scholars of Greek history. But the year 1000, 1000, there were paper mills in Cairo. Year 1002, there were paper mills in Islamic Spain. And the Muslims wanted to keep it a monopoly, like the Chinese did. But it leached into northern Europe, into northern Italy. And so paper arrived in the 13th, 14th century. And that created the basis of the Renaissance. Now, this role of paper in history is extremely important because you have in the Chinese people a willingness to share information which other cultures do not have. And China today 
has again become the most information-intensive society in the world. Many people don't realize that during the three years of COVID, China was not marking time. People were not at home playing with their computers. They were making things. So when they had the motor car show in Shanghai recently, Western companies, Japanese companies were shocked that in those three years, the Chinese auto industry surged ahead. And just a few days ago, China reported that it exported more cars than Japan. It already produces more cars than anybody else by a long shot. And for electric vehicles, they are way ahead of anybody else. And it's not just the cars, but what's in the cars. You know, in the West, because of security concerns and because US intelligence agencies do not want to lose their monopoly of being able to surveil everybody, you ban Huawei because Huawei could do the same thing. But in so doing, you have denied yourself of 5G. China today has, by the end of this year, we have 3 million base stations for 5G, all the way to the base camp of Mount Everest, which means that the average Chinese has much more bandwidth than the average American or European or Singaporean. And when you have bandwidth, there are products and services which young people can develop and experiment with, which others elsewhere could not. And this year, China will account for 35% of global growth. They talk about 5% growth. In economists say maybe 6%. Well, that might be too optimistic. But China will grow at more than 5% this year, and probably faster next year. And unlike in the advanced economies, where all that money printed is causing inflation to go up, in China, interest rates are trending down. Now, the other, in my view, I'm not a scholar, but just my observation, reason why Chinese civilization has such a deep continuity is because of the writing system. It is pictographic or ideographic and not alphabetic. If it's alphabetic, the words change with pronunciation, which changes naturally. But in a pictographic system, the value of the character doesn't change. So we present a European high school student with something written somewhere in Europe 2,000 years ago. He can read it. You have to attend university to read it. A high school Chinese student can read what was written 2,000 years ago. And after a day explaining the phrases, the context, he can at least read it and begin to understand its meaning. And for a population twice that of Europe, there's only one literature. There's only one set of heroes, one mythology. Whereas in Europe, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, it is diverse. So each has its own nature. Each makes its own contribution to human civilization. The idea that the country is a large family is in the Chinese DNA. The country is described as a quartia, a country family. And therefore, it needs a pate familias. It requires moral leadership. So in China today, when Xi Jinping or Chinese leaders make speeches, they are boring because they are all moral disquisitions. And you have to make references to the past, to precedents. And the information is in the nuance. I tell Alex, it's like reading paper encyclicals. There's a strange parallel between the Catholic Church and China, you know, because both have long continuity, both requires detailed record keeping. One has a priesthood, the other has a communist priesthood. Both govern on the basis of moral assertions. 
those who think that China is no longer communist are very badly mistaken because they take their ideological, philosophical underpinnings very seriously. But it is not superficial Marxism or Leninism. It's Marxism-Leninism as interpreted in Chinese history. Now, I talked earlier about the dynastic histories, 23 of them. Mao Zedong read all of them repeatedly, made annotations with, with his usual scrawl. So you go to a painting bookshop, you can find the 23 dynastic histories with Mao Zedong's handwritten scrolls with what they meant and annotations on his annotations. And yet the last dynasty's history is not yet written. Now I recount all this just to make a point that China is not easily understood. And the Jesuits, when they went in the 16th century, they knew this. My hero, Matteo Ricci, Chinese name Li Mato, he thought he should dress like a monk, only to discover that in China, monks are looked down upon by the scholars. But he had an encyclopedic memory, and probably one of the most brilliant men Europe has ever produced. So he mastered the Chinese classics. He put on the robe of a scholar. He helped the Chinese correct the calendar, maintain the clocks in the palaces. Compared notes with them on astronomy. At that time, the Jesuits knew that in order to persuade China, to convince them, they had to go into the depths of Chinese philosophy. So just the translation of Deus into, China, into Chinese was very difficult because China had no equivalent concept of an intervening God. When Francis Xavier went to Japan, he found a name which turned out to be that of a minor Japanese deity. So that wouldn't do. Matteo Ricci thought deeply. The Chinese had the concept of heaven. It's, a, it's really a monotheistic idea because there's only one heaven and there's only one humanity. And the emperor is the son of heaven, Tianzi. And he governs on the basis of a mandate of heaven. Tianming. And Matthew Ricci's translation of God was the Lord of Heaven, Tian Tzu. Until today, the translation of the Catholic religion into Chinese is the religion of the Lord of Heaven, Tian Tzu Tiao. A Harvard scholar, an Orthodox Jew, showed me the catechism books produced by the Jesuits in the 16th, 17th century. They showed Jesus and Mary and the apostles as Chinese. As Chinese, because, well, you're not going to impress the Chinese people about ideas of God if they look like foreigners with big noses and different colored hair and so on. In the 19th century, when the missionaries had guns and gunboats, Jesus and Mary became European with blue eyes and blonde hair. Then it was seen by Chinese revolutionaries as a foreign religion and a threat. I mean, when Cortes went to Tenochtitlan, his advantage was the Aztecs had a myth that God would come from overseas and would be white. So once your God is a foreigner, the conquest is complete. And therefore, an essential part of the Chinese Revolution was the rejection of Christianity as a foreign religion. And the Chinese have repeatedly said that Christianity has to be sinicized. The way Buddhism, after many centuries, was thoroughly sinicized in China to a point where even though Chinese people intellectually know that Buddhism came from China, they think of Buddha and the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin as, as Chinese with whom they have a personal connection. Christianity will have to go through 
a similar transformation. And in a sense, going back to what it was in the 16th, 17th century. Pope Francis has no problem with that. Because when he was in Mexico, at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and my wife had a miraculous cure which we attribute to the Virgin of Guadalupe, because she had a terrible cancer and, and the, they thought she was going to die. But after we prayed there, we went back, the next MRI showed that the tumor completely disappeared and it was on the feast day of the Nativity of Our Lady. But that's, that's, that's an aside. Pope Francis said that Mother Mary had apparitions throughout the world, hundreds of them. But in only one apparition did she leave behind her image, and that was in Guadalupe. And that was of her as a mestiza. As a mestiza. And when the Pope went to visit a Rohingya camp in Bangladesh, at Cox's Bazaar, to comfort them, he said, God is Rohingya. When I address alumni of Peking University in Singapore at the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement, I said, God is Chinese. Now, they, they, there was a stir in the audience. It is nothing new. The Jesuits understood this from the beginning, that in order to persuade, in order to attract, you must insert, you must inculturate. And only when you do that, when you're interested in me, I like you, because you're interested in me. If you're not interested in me, and all you want is to proselytize, I'm not interested in you. But if you're interested in me, my fears, my hopes, I find you very attractive. And that begins the process of persuasion, a chemistry. Between Europe and China, there was such a chemistry. But during the period of Western ascendancy, there was no longer any need for a chemistry because the interaction was by force. You're losing that force. But you continue to have many things to impart to the rest of the world. And it must be done not by proselytizing, but by being attractive. And you become attractive by being interested in others. And when you are, a process begins. The Chinese, you know, we just had the G7 meeting in Hiroshima. And there were many statements which the Chinese found highly offensive because it asserted a China which the Chinese don't believe is a fair description. And they remember that of the eight of the G7 countries, if you take away Canada and add in Austro-Hungary and Russia, these eight countries were the ones who ravaged China in the infamous eight-country alliance in 1898. All Chinese people remember that, how they ravaged China and took away artifacts which are still in Western museums. So when the G7 makes these accusations, emotionally, there is a reaction. But they've decided that they are growing, and that the China today is not the China of 100 years ago. In 2003, a big group of scholars produced a wonderful series in 12 episodes, each 45 minutes, called The Rise of the Great Powers. And it began with Henry the Navigator of Portugal. And how this tiny nation, at the end of the world, at the end of the Reconquista, decided to go out, followed by Spain. And how in Tordesillas, they got the Pope to divide the world between the two of them, which was astonishing. Then they talk about Holland and how it created the joint stock company, which was a great 
innovation in global finance, the idea of limited liability. Of course, it accounts for many of our problems today too, but without limited liability, the modern economy could not have come about, and for which we have to thank the Dutch. The episode on France was fascinating because it began with a debate in the French Assembly about whether Alexander Dumas should enter the Pantheon. And Jacques Chirac weighed in. The commentator said, what country is this? What civilization is this? That there should be a national debate about a writer. On Russia, the episode began with Peter the Great witnessing the execution of his own son. To make the point that reform is dangerous business. And if you fail, you die. Great Britain had two episodes, in one of which they quoted Churchill when he said that Shakespeare is more important, more valuable to the empire than all of India. It was a reflection. The series was produced without rancor, almost with admiration, but with one purpose, to study, to learn, to avoid mistakes. So today, I would say that China's understanding of Europe is much greater than Europe's understanding of China. But to have a chemistry, it must be two-way. And institutions like the SDG should be a part of it. To continue in the tradition of Marco Polo or Matteo Ricci, The big question in the world today is a titanic contest between the US and China. The US is a relatively young country. The Chinese think that it's, it's almost infantile because it's only 300 years. <laughs> it's about the, the length of one dynasty. And to think that a piece of paper, the US Constitution, can forever define that society they consider it a bit curious, but still, it is big, it is powerful, it is almost frightening. The problem is this. The U.S. believes that China will behave like an imperial power when it becomes big or bigger. Now, China's per capita GDP is about 20% of the U.S. today. Now, it's not inconceivable that the per capita income in China reaches half that of the US. Because the Chinese are hardworking people, strong families, high savers, passionate about education. If China achieves half the per capita of the US, China's GDP will be that of the US and the EU combined. Now, if you're in business, we say, oh, yeah, this, this, is, this is very important information because it means that wherever you are, your biggest market, your biggest threat, your biggest opportunity will be China. And if that's the case, you better make sure that all your key people understand China, if not for offensive purposes, at least for defensive purposes. And it is on the cards. We may be, let's say, by 2050, 2060, 2070, we can be out by 10, 20 years, but without nuclear war, it's unstoppable. So this is the future we're talking about. And by 2050, given demographic trends, thirty percent of the world's population will be African, forty percent Muslim, and by 2050, maybe one in two babies will be Muslim. So it is into that world that we've got to see the future and the relations among the great powers. China does not want to take on the US as global hegemon, not because they can't, but they think it is foolish. They think that to attempt to do it will lead to your own self-destruction. And they have ample examples in their own history that when they started interfering 
in the affairs of others, you in the end boomerang back on them. The idea that American fleets should be in the Baltic, in the Black Sea, in the South China Sea, in the Sea of Okhotsk, wherever, they think, well, you can do that because you have the capability, but it costs you a fortune. And you can only do it now because you have the US dollar and the exorbitant privilege which comes to the US dollar. Now, we remember in the 60s, the Vietnam War, which was very expensive. And Johnson wanted to carry on with the Great Society program. So in the end, the US dollar had to be depacked from gold, and it led to horrifying inflation, which Paul Volcker later had to squeeze out at horrible pain to the entire world. They don't want to do that. In fact, in my view, they will never open the domestic capital market fully to London and New York. Because you do that, you lose control of monetary policy within the country. And China has always this belief that to preserve its homogeneity, and it's 92% Han, to preserve its homogeneity, you must always build walls around yourself. It can be a physical wall, it can be a capital markets wall, it can be a wall on Hollywood movies, on textbooks, and the most remarkable war of all in recent years, a biological war that they build. You know, in the national anthem, which they sing every day, they talk about rebuilding walls. The Americans don't know this. They think that, like themselves, the Chinese are also a proselytizing missionary power. The Americans, when they come to Asia, Sometimes it's cynical, but usually it's sincere. Their wish is for you to become like them. And they kept lecturing Lee Kuan Yew. He got so exasperated. So he said, make me a 51st state, and I'll follow your instructions. Then you look after me, you look after my defense. Now the question for Europe is this. You rely on the US for your defense, for your security. NATO, the Transatlantic Alliance. Is the EU, is that the foundation of the EU? Well, it's a big question in, in, in the future of Europe. What is European autonomy? It's not one or zero, but in which direction do you want to move? And what happens if the US turns inwards? Does this mean that you no longer have a foundation for European Union? So these are big issues. And the position Europe takes in the world will have a big bearing on whether we have peace or war between the US and China. Because if Europe, because of the transatlantic alliance, follows US policy on issues vital to China, particularly Taiwan, the likelihood of war goes up. But if Europe says, look, on these issues we agree with you because we are from the same civilization, but on those issues, no, then the Americans will be more circumspect and war becomes less likely. Because it's not triangular. It is bipolar with Europe somewhere at the fulcrum. And it can lean a little more to one side or the other and maintain stability. And if Europe does that, the transition to a multipolar world will be a much smoother one. But to do that, you need knowledge. It cannot be just the result of domestic electoral necessities. It cannot be the whim of political leaders who have no sense of history and little understanding of it. You need scholars, you need think tanks, you need Jesuits. It's very important, because on the other side, they have their counterparts. And Taiwan is an issue so lightly played that it's alarming to me. How European leaders, European countries say, oh no, we, we love Taiwanese, we love Taiwan. They know nothing about Taiwan, but they love Taiwan. 
And they love to visit Taiwan, even though they can't remember the names and the places they visit. They do that in order to support the Americans and to satisfy themselves that they are being tough with China. Because China is too big, we've got to show that we are also strong. But Taiwan is a wrong card to play. Because for the Chinese, Taiwan is a matter of historical justice. In the 1944 Decem December, no, 1943 December in Cairo, Stalin met Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek. And in the Cairo Declaration, they make clear that Taiwan will be returned to China. In Potsdam, after the war ended in Europe, July 1945, uh, it was Truman. And then halfway, Churchill was replaced by Attlee because he had lost the elections in the UK, and Stalin. And they reaffirmed the Cairo Declaration in the Potsdam Proclamation. In other words, the status of Taiwan was long settled. During the Civil War in China, the American Navy helped the KMT to occupy islands in the South China Sea because the US accepted that those islands were part of China. They were occupied by Japan as a part of China. And so they returned to China. But now, because China is a preoccupation, many issues are being revisited despite the history. But for the Chinese, Taiwan was lost because their fleet was sunk by Japan in 1994. And there was a humiliating peace agreement called the Treaty of Shimonoseki that year, leading to Japan taking over Taiwan and ruling it for 50 years. For China, it is not an issue which is negotiable. And any Chinese leader who takes an, a different position, however autocratic, will lose the overwhelming support of the Chinese people. Now, other issues you can talk about. You can talk about trade, you can talk about intellectual property, you can talk about chips. I think the Chinese can, can, can look after themselves. But on Taiwan, they will go to war. If they believe that the US intends to keep Taiwan separate, independent if possible, forever. The accusation is made that China is about to invade Taiwan. That Xi Jinping wants to do it for his legacy. This will not explain why in 2015, in Singapore, Xi Jinping, two years after he became president, met Ma ying the president of Taiwan in Singapore, as an equal. It was never done before. It was at unprecedented. And it was done at great risk to himself. They had dinner at the Shangri-La Hotel. I was in a quad group at the time, so I asked, who paid for the bill? I was told, 50-50, down to the last cent, 50-50. Xi Jinping, of course, brought his 52% Mao Tai from Guizhou. My ink not to be outdone, brought his 52% Qingmen Kaoliang. Both very good liquors and very warm words exchanged. Now, Xi Jinping was not doing it for Ma Ying-Chiu because Ma ying was stepping down. He was doing it for Tsai Ing-wen, whom everybody knew would be the next president. I call on Tsai Ing-wen after she was elected, before she was installed, and she grumbled that the mainland was not forthcoming. I said, but Xi Jinping has just opened a road for you. It's not a super highway, but it's a pretty good road. She kept quiet. She knew what I meant. But she would not take that road because even though she became president on the Constitution of the Republic of China, her own party constitution of the DPP, the first article says, our mission is to establish an independent republic of Taiwan. So when Western powers lightly encourage the DPP to flirt with independence, you're touching a life wire. It will have consequences. So 
Well, I do not believe that China wants to invade Taiwan lightly. I believe that China will move if they are convinced that Taiwan has embarked on the road to independence. China can abjure the use of force any more than Madrid can abjure the use of force if Catalonia were to declare independence unilaterally. Any more than London can abjure the use of force if Scotland were to declare independence unilaterally, or even Northern Ireland. But because you do not abjure the use of force, so we can be polite to one another and negotiate peaceful outcomes. But the mood in the Western media, partly deliberate, partly reflecting the mores of the time, is to paint the picture of China, which is very dramatic and very black, and is leading to wrong decisions being taken in Europe. And yet the decisions being taken in Europe will have huge consequences for the world, and of course, for Europe itself. So Alex, let me end here, and then we can have a conversation. Hello? Yeah. yeah? Hi, everybody. So I've got the um, very big pleasure of moderating the discussion this afternoon. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. Uh, so when um, if the microphone will be brought to you, if you could just stand up and briefly introduce yourself before you ask your questions, and we will take things from there. So hands, please, if you have a question. Mahoud. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yu, uh, for your insightful uh, speech. My name is Mahmoud Jawadi. I'm the second year master's student here at the School of Transnational Governance. Well, my question is a bit about the, the state of play and the status quo and the future of the EU-China relations. In 2019, the European Union characterized China as competitor, uh, rival, and also partner. And since then until now, Different European officials just describe uh, China as an, an assertive power or sometimes describe it as a country tries to rewrite the international order. But two weeks ago, again, uh, Mr. Borrell submitted a paper at Gimnich meeting stating China as partner, rival, and competitor. So there is no change in characterization of China. Uh, so my question is that how accurate that characterization and that vision and uh, if you think that it is not really accurate, what would be your prescription in order just to characterize China for Europe? Thank you. For a number of centuries, the West has been used to being dominant in the world. I talk about Jesus Christ from being Chinese to being European. An equivalent process must, not, must now take place to bring us to a better balance point, it will take time. That the Americans from helping China rise again, now fear China's rise, is to be expected. That there should be a Western response, should also be expected. China will not escalate because it knows it's getting stronger and philosophically has a deep sense of itself. But at the same time, they cannot afford to show weakness. And just by being firm and being independent, the Chinese are giving hope to others. They, they too can stand firm and be independent, even though they are weaker. And this will help crystallize a multipolar world. But this is not a process which the Americans can take lightly, and not even a process which the entire West will take lightly. So we're in the period of a great transition, but it will come about. And to some extent, the global economic situation and the Ukraine war will help precipitate gradually this future. Um. <clears throat> 
Oh, you're from Iran? Oh, okay. <laughs> then, then I will elaborate later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my name is Tomáš Suc. I'm from Hungary. I'm currently here for a one-year uh, visiting fellowship. But I work for the European Commission otherwise. And uh, thank you for the amazing uh, lecture. Very insightful. And... Uh, my question is basically also specifically because you have been Minister for Culture and also Minister for Foreign Affairs among many other titles. Uh, how do you see the role of culture in foreign policy in general and the role and use of soft power uh, in China in particular? Because there are quite controversial views, especially since Xi Jinping uh, took power so basically that's the question. <clears throat> Thank you. In my years in government, I found that uh, culture touches the opposite party the most and is the most remembered. Uh, I knew Frank Walter Steinmeier when he was foreign minister. And what we most remember is a little project when I had a piece of the Berlin Wall in my constituency. And I asked Helmut Kohl, whom I was a minister in attendance to in 1994, and at that time was already a recluse. I asked for a message from him through hostel ship, and he gave me that message. I don't think Steinmeier remembers me for anything else. In my relationship with India, I was for 10 years involved in the revival of an ancient Buddhist university called Nalanda, which was recorded in great detail by a Chinese monk in the seventh century but which history was long forgotten. It, had, it was the world's first university. It was destroyed by Afghan invaders after Oxford was established, but before Cambridge. And in India, they did not know the history. But in China, that history is immortalized in the journey to the West and the story of the monkey god. Never lost. In the 19th century, the British archaeologists Alexander Cunningham, who started the Archaeological Survey of India, a great institution. He read a translation of what the monk wrote in the 7th century, and he was astonished by its accuracy. And after that, grew in India a group of uh, Buddha sahibs, they call them, you know, who, were, who were archaeologists working off Chinese records of India. So the Indians remembered me and gave me a very high award for this university project. And I've, with the Russians, I help, I'm still helping them establish their church in Singapore. And the Russian foreign ministry remembers me not for my work in the trade ministry or foreign ministry, but for my work in helping them establish a church in Singapore. So culture touches people the most deeply. They'll forget everything else, but they never forget how he treated them in their identity. Uh, Morton Bergsma, I'm the director of Silverup, the Center for International Law Research and Policy. We have an office here in Florence. Thank you for your uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, in uh, uh, the question of Xinjiang and the Uyghurs, uh, the US State Department and various British actors are saying that there has been genocide. Whilst the leading scholars of the law uh, of, of genocide they say that there is no evidence, there is no proof, and that the US State Department should stop using this classification unless it produces the proof. By making use of such classifications as genocide and crimes against humanity, one also generates feelings of blameworthiness and that there is a threat. Uh, uh, from the Chinese uh, government. W what are your thoughts on the way the US and, and British actors use human rights terminology, the human rights narrative, and soft international law uh, in the contest which you refer to between the United States and China? Well, it's part of uh, the information warfare that makes it very difficult for us sometimes to know what to believe and what not to believe. I first accompanied Lee Kuan Yew to Xinjiang in the year 2000, just before he stepped down as Prime Minister. Yes. 
it's okay. It's, that's not Xinjiang. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was surprised when I went there to find that road signs were in Roman characters, in Chinese characters, and in Arabic characters. So I asked accompanying Chinese officials, I said, when did that happen? I always say Mao Zedong wanted it. In fact, when the communists took over, they restored the names of many places to their Uyghur names. But of course, the Chinese attitude is, you are a minority, you threaten me politically, I smash you. Like they did with Yakub Bey in the 19th century, the Qing dynasty. But if you don't threaten me, then I'm very generous to you. In fact, I treat you better than Han people. So the population policy never applied to the Uyghurs. And that's why there are many more Uyghurs today in proportionate terms than Han Chinese and any other group. So there's certainly no physical genocide. In 2001 August, I went to Xinjiang, the trade delegation, and I went to Kashka. In Kashka, I saw women in Central Asian burkas, which is a whole basket put on top of their head. I was shocked. I asked Chinese officials, say, why do you allow this? They said, no, it's a custom. When I was at Urumuchi, Urumuchi, they took me horse riding. I can't ride a horse to save myself. So they said, no, don't worry. A young girl or boy will hop behind you, a Kazakh, and they'll gallop the horse. And it was very exciting. I tried to speak to her in my poor Mandarin. She could not understand me. So again, I asked the Chinese, I said, why aren't you teaching them Chinese? He said, no, they're nomads, no, we leave them alone. They did not realize then, it was two weeks before September 11, that the Salafis had been working on their minds. And from 2010 to 2015, there were a spate of terrorist incidents in China to a point where the Han people in Xinjiang had to arm themselves. I also knew this from my cousins in China who used to go to Xinjiang, and then during that period, they say it's no longer safe. And now they're all over Xinjiang again because peace has returned. So this whole story that there's genocide in Xinjiang, to me, does not reflect what's happening there. Yes, they have been draconian in making sure that Salafi influence is controlled in China. But all countries, including Singapore, face this problem. And it's interesting that no Muslim country today has condemned China on the Xinjiang policy. But when I was uh, cruising in Croatia, someone told me what an Italian professor in Chengdu said. It's quite interesting. Take it in the right spirit, you know. He said, the Chinese, the, the Americans are not known to love Chinese. They're not known to love Muslims. But somehow they love Chinese Muslims a lot. So that's my answer to your question. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Sonia Puncha Rickman, a member of the External Advisory Board and of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Thank you very much for a utterly inspiring speech. I have try to keep track of Chinese development, reading a lot, but yeah, I will certainly not uh, have reached the point of Matteo Ricci. Uh, I have a question with, which is a politico-philosophical question. How would you um, estimate the Chinese capacity to deal with discontinuities and to integrate that into the Taiwanese question. Uh, perhaps you will now tell me that I don't understand anything of Taiwan, and I would take that. But it is a democratic state. Is that not the case, in your opinion? And if so, um, how would, um, in a Chinese reading, um, to be dealt with with this democratic development as a different one as uh, China has experienced um, in order to perhaps 
assess the whole question of independence in a different way? Is that at all feasible, thinkable, etc.? We had a similar development with Hong Kong, hadn't we? Uh, where there was this solution of um, one country, two systems. And, um, well, I don't think that China really lived up to that. But, yeah, perhaps you see this differently. Thank you. China never accepted the Treaty of Nanjing, which uh, ceded Hong Kong in perpetuity to the British as being a valid treaty. They never accepted that. The issue was not put to the test because a large part of Hong Kong on the mainland side was leased to uh, Britain uh, for 99 years. And, and even by British uh, law, that land had to be returned. And when that land is returned, Hong Kong is no longer viable. In 1984, 1982, Margaret Thatcher visited Teng Xiaoping and mooted the idea of uh, another 50 years of British rule. Uh, she was badly advised. Uh, Teng Xiaoping, with great accuracy, spat into a spittoon. You know? <laughs> and Margaret Thatcher was so rattled when she left the Great Hall of the People, she tripped on the steps. And they knew that that's not negotiable. So in 1984, they had the Joint Declaration. Now, the Joint Declaration is asserted by the British as a treaty which bound China post-1997. Uh, China never accepted that. The Joint Declaration is called a Joint Declaration because you make your declaration, I make my declaration, we put it up together in order to facilitate a smooth handover on June 30th, 1997. It was not the treaty. If it was the treaty like the Treaty of Nanjing, it would have been called a treaty. So the Chinese are saying, once we have a smooth handover, sovereignty has returned to China. But China in this declaration said that it will promulgate a basic law, which it legislated in consultation of Hong Kong people, under which one country, two systems would last for 50 years. In that basic law, a national security law in Hong Kong must be enacted. So for 20 over years, it was never enacted, which means that in terms of performance, it, 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 Hong Kong failed to keep up its side of the bargain. So the mainland then imposed national security law on Hong Kong, but still requires Hong Kong to make subsidiary legislation. And that's right now being done. I lived in Hong Kong during that period, uh, and my wife and I no longer felt safe. I saw the way the social media uh, was systematically demonizing the police, and the Hong Kong police is nothing like police in Paris or Los Angeles or New York. And they were extremely well behaved, but they were made to look as if they all had horns and tails, which was utterly not the case. But there was a game being played. Kui Bono, who benefited from the Hong Kong uh, unrest? It led to the re-election of Tsai Ing-wen because all the pundits said that she would lose to uh, Han Kuo Yu. But because of what happened in Hong Kong, the whole table turned. So I have a very interpretation of Hong Kong, and it's based upon my own experience living there and the sort of things which were happening. That when they stormed the legislature, I think it was Nancy Pelosi who said, oh, what a glorious sight, until January 6 happened. <laughs> then it didn't look so glorious after that. So the double standards were so thick, you could cut through it with a knife. Yeah. So I... On Taiwan, China has told Taiwan, you can keep the army. So long as you accept the idea of one China, you can interpret it the way you want. It means that you're not going independent. And one day when we unite, maybe I'll drop PRC, you drop ROC, and we can call it China. Yeah. So it is an internal affair. It is one of reconciliation. You know, when Annalena Baerbock, the, the German foreign secretary, visited foreign minister visited uh, China recently, State Councillor Wang Yi, who was a former foreign minister, he said something which to me was very moving. He said, we supported German unific reunification. We hope Germany will support our reunification. Germany was divided because it was an aggressor. China was divided because it was a victim. So the moral cause of German reunification it's on any balance greater than German reunification. I thought that was a very powerful message that Wang Yi, Wang Yi uh, put across. But 
it was hardly reported in your media. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my name is Farhan, I'm from Indonesia, your neighbor. So, <laughs> uh, I'm, interesting with your, I'm interested in your speech that you said that we are moving towards the multipolar world and we hope it's going to be a very peaceful process. And I'm interested in what's your view about Southeast Asia? Because uh, in my mind, I have like a two scenarios for Southeast Asia. Like, the first scenario is like, uh, Southeast Asia will be like the Latin America for the U.S. when they rise, which means they are going to be the hinterland for China, the, the backyard for China. Or, in more optimistic scenario, I think that Southeast Asia will be the hub for the world because now Europe, U.S., they're going to East Asia, then they are finding place to find the common places, Southeast Asia. And what's your view? What, do you have any other think about Southeast Asia in the future when we are seeing the multipolar world? Thank you very much. Well, ASEAN is, is very important. And ASEAN can be a weak pole in a multipolar world, not a strong pole, because ASEAN hasn't got the ICBMs and nuclear submarines to threaten other people. But Southeast Asia is diverse. Uh, historically and geographically is between the great civilizations of East Asia and South Asia. We have this wonderful saying in Sabah, you know, Tana di bawa angin, the land below the winds, the trade winds, that's Southeast Asia. And uh, it welcomes people from all over the world. No one feels unwelcome in Indonesia or in Phuket or in, in Singapore. You can be from Mars, you'll still be welcome in Southeast Asia. This is our culture. But our integration into a larger Chinese-dominated economy is inevitable. And historically, every time China was united, there was a great China trade, which gave prosperity to the kingdoms of Southeast Asia. And we are seeing a replay of the historical cycle. China's trade with uh, uh, ASEAN overtook China's trade with Europe and America some years ago. China's trade with ASEAN is greater than U.S. trade with Europe and will reach $1 trillion this year. And, you know, the Chinese, China's a coal country, they all want to have homes in Indonesia yeah. because the climate is, is, is balmy, the food is good, the people are friendly. So I see a relationship between China and Southeast Asia which will endure, but they know that in Southeast Asia, we are promiscuous. We don't want monogamous relationships. Now, Xi Jinping, not Xi Jinping, Tu Rongji, in the year 2000, I was there at an ASEAN-China summit. He proposed a free trade agreement with ASEAN. At that time, ASEAN countries were still reeling from the Asian financial crisis and did not know how to respond. But in the end, we agreed. And when the framework agreement was signed in Phnom Penh in 2002, Tu Rongji said, China does not seek for itself an exclusive position in Southeast Asia. China has never changed that position. In other words, by all means, be friendly to the Americans, Japanese, Europeans, but please take into account my own interests. If you hurt me, I'll hurt you, but I will not make my enemy your enemy, which is increasingly what Americans are telling us, that America's enemies are our enemies. And the use of long arm jurisdiction, which is causing a lot of angst all over the world, and leading to de-dollarization. But it will take time. But there is a big difference between the, the way China handles Southeast Asia with the way the US handles Southeast Asia. In the case of Europe, because you no longer have a strategic uh, impact on Southeast Asia, you're welcome in every country. So Europe is a free rider in Southeast Asia. In terms of the business management, my question to you is, what can the European Union do to improve a real understanding of Confucian culture 
in terms of business management and also looking at the future of business management, how can we understand better and implement better the Chinese contribution to business, man business management in terms of yin and yang. These are enormous contributions which I think China can make to the future of uh, business management. How can the European Union help in promoting uh, a better understanding of culture in this sense? Well, uh, I, th I think uh, European cultural and educational institutions can play a, a big role. Uh, I've been an advisor to IESE Business School in Barcelona uh, for over 10 years. And I just came over from Barcelona uh, after delivering the commencement speech to the 2023 MBA class. Uh, EAC has wanted, 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 wanted American, wanted European, wanted Asian in the student population. And just in their daily interactions, people by osmosis learn from one another uh, what it means uh, to, to live on a daily basis with diversity. And it stimulates mutual respect. And a school like STG should do that. I think more and more European institutions should somehow incorporate the diversity of the world into Europe. Now, Europe's management of its own internal diversity is, is fascinating and provides inspiration to the rest of the world. But that internal integration cannot be done without connection to the world outside. And the world outside is diverse. And when we see how diverse the world is, it makes it easier for us to manage our own internal diversity. I did a short posting of my meeting with uh, uh, Alex yesterday in Facebook, and someone asked, what is transnational governance? I said, well, it's mostly about Europe's internal governance. <laughs> but I added, Europe's internal governance, if it succeeds, is good for the world. If within Europe you fail, then we will fail in the world. So from that perspective, I wrote, we have an equity interest in the success of the European experiment. But you should not conduct this experiment without reference to the world outside. Okay, I think, I think we have time for a couple more questions only, and there's approximately one million hands. Um, Michele, I saw you first. <laughs> Hello, thank you. I'm Michele Giovanardi from Italy, and I'm here project associate at the School of Transnational Governance. So my question is, uh, again, you touched upon Taiwan and how this is not an expression of an imperialist kind of uh, uh, way of seeing the world, but uh, a, a way of seeing a just order in the world. But of course, in international politics, uh, you know, uh, different states can have different kind of idea of, about a, a just world order. And what is, can be seen as something just can also be seen as something imperialist or expansionist. So I think the key here is uh, to, to, really, um, um, to really succeed in what you say, to, to build trust uh, between the parties, to convince them what you're saying is, is in fact something not uh, another step in, a, in, a, in, a power, in power politics, but something uh, about the just world order. So about trust, uh, uh, how do we what are the concrete steps that we can uh, uh, envision uh, to build trust between uh, Europe and China? Um, uh, it begins by being interested in the other, which means respecting the other. And once you do that, you begin to see the good on the other side. And then it's, it's more difficult for you to be angry with the other party. You know? People get enraged when they don't understand the other side, then you can kill. But when you realize that the other side has the same hopes and fears as you have, with family and children to worry about, then it will cause you to pause. And perchance, to say, oh, maybe, maybe we can explain why they are behaving that way. Well, China has taken a dangerous but very interesting step to make proposals for peace in Ukraine. The peace proposal is just a statement of principles. So it's not likely to get anywhere for the time being. But at some point in time, the various parties will be exhausted. Right now, they're still giving war a chance. 
at some point in time, they have to give peace a chance, and you have to be a ceasefire. I don't think there'll be a peace agreement for a long time. There'll be some kind of a partition, which is the reason why Henry Kissinger hinted at it when he said that Ukraine should join NATO, not only to protect Ukraine, but to protect NATO from Ukraine, which means almost a colonization of Ukraine to maintain the peace. Now, the Chinese envoy said, because mathematically there's no solution, he said, we can't talk peace unless the parties in their hearts open up a little space for the other. In other words, it's not just the work of diplomats. It is in the propaganda when we get people to hate the other. That are you prepared to, to loosen up and say, look, see possible good in the other? Then the process of negotiation can begin. But that, it will not begin until both sides are exhausted by war. Right to the back. Gentleman in this tripe shirt. Thank you. My name is Umberto. I'm a visiting fellow here. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, we speculated a lot about what the war with a more uh, dominant role for China would be in the future. And you mentioned briefly the war in Ukraine. Um, I was about to ask you what is your take about China non-opposition to the invasion of a sovereign country. So, I mean, if you think about the, the perspective that European has, we have seen similar situation like the Russian invasion of China in the 30s, in the 40s. This resonates very deeply with us, what has happened uh, between Ukraine and Russia. So I was wondering uh, what is the way in which China is seeing this conflict in a way that does not bring it to openly condemn the invasion of a sovereign country as neighbor? From a geopolitical viewpoint, China wants Russia to be a separate pole to stand up to the US. So if, if there's regime change in, in, in Russia, and Russia becomes a part of a Western alliance, then China will come under much greater pressure. So from that higher perspective, China would not want Russia to fail. So economically, China will support Russia. But militarily, Ukraine is a distant war for them, over which they don't think they have complete understanding, and about which they don't think they should get too involved, except as a peacemaker, if there's room for a peacemaker. That's what they do. Uh, they don't support invasion. They've said that in the first principle. But at the same time, they say there's a history to it, which was NATO's relentless expansion to the east which the Chinese have always opposed because it bifurcates the world and it is divisive and, and aggressive. So China is saying, look, if you want peace, you can't just look at a snapshot. If you, you've got to look at the entire video. And then when you look at the entire video, you'll find a way to the future. But if you just look at a snapshot, you won't find a way to the future. I am informed by the powers that be that we can keep going. So, uh, since we're having such an interesting discussion, maybe I'm looking at the powers. Two more, two more questions? Yeah, okay. Okay, Mr. John. Hi, hi, my name is Gao Hen John, and um, uh, I'm a Jean Monnet Residential Fellow this year at the UI, but normally I teach, I am an Associate Professor of Italian Studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And um, I was um, born and raised in Hangzhou in the PC, um, P PRC, and, uh, but I've been living in, um, uh, in the States and Canada for a while. So my question um, touches upon China and Europe's engagement in Africa and how that engagement can, shape, can potentially shape the future 
between these two geopolitical entities. I think in the discussion so far, we have touched upon their relationship in the Pacific Rim and um, Eurasia just right now. So I'd like to you know, um, consult your take on their engagement in Africa. And we know the context is that Europe taken as a whole is the top investor in Africa and China is making strides. And the media, the Western media at least, has been covering a lot on their conflicts, but sometimes collaborations as well. So that's my question. Thank you. In my uh, script, I covered Africa and the Middle East, but, but I didn't have time just now. Uh, to me, uh, Europe and China share common interests in the Middle East, which is to help the Africans develop. Uh, because of the color revolutions, migration from Europe has, has been growing. It's becoming a big problem for Europe for Italy, for France, for many countries. Uh, so there is every interest for Europe to help Africa develop, to stabilize Africa. But Africa will not be stabilized in your own image. Africa will be stabilized, can only be stabilized if you take into account its tribal character. If you ignore the tribal character of, of, of Africa, democracy will fail. Just as if you ignore the tribal history of Europe, you will fail in Europe. Yeah. So, China today is building much of Africa's infrastructure. And they're doing it in their own self-interest to extract minerals, trade, but also to win goodwill because it's 54 votes in the UN and, and these votes are important to China. So I'm an advisor to a, a Chinese company that's become Singaporean, uh, investing in a very big iron ore mine in a West African country for which they have to build a 600-kilometer railroad. And once that railroad is built, the whole country will be transformed because then the, the inland spaces can gain access to the sea, which is the internet, right? Then you can trade, then the value of your labor will be much greater. So by right, China and Africa, sorry, Europe and China should work together to help Africa develop. So I was very troubled to read uh, President Ursula von der Leyen recently saying that Europe helping Africa should be in competition with China. She suggested that. Why? And Europe, Africa has not the good historical memory of Europe, which has enslaved it, colonized it, and now you're telling me who my friend should be. So they resent it powerfully. So if you interview any African leader, they will tell you rubbish. We will deal with China on our own terms because China is helping us. And there's none of the historical baggage. So Europe should be working with China in Africa and in the entire Middle East. Now, the Americans have a different agenda. For them, it's just big power contest. And here in Middle East and on Africa, I think the American and European agendas diverge. And Europe should seek greater autonomy and be more circumspect in its own self-interest in working with China. Last question. Thank you, sir, for your insightful presentation. And I'm Kun Hao Yang. I come from China. I'm now a PhD researcher at the Department of Law at UI. So my question is about the... Sorry? At UI. At UI, yeah, I'm sorry. So my question is about, from the Chinese perspective, about the Europe's in China's future. So as the EU is adjusting the Chinese strategy and proposing the de-risking, strategy rather than a decoupling that the U.S. won. And the EU is trying to make this, this risking to the G7 level, to more like a circle surrounding China. So what do you think from the Chinese perspective? It is a kind of opportunity or challenge. And what kind of reactions may incur from the Chinese side to this, this risking strategy? Thanks. Many years ago, I was a visiting scholar in Peking University. And when I was there, I was invited by the China's National Defense University, Guofang Da, to give a speech about U.S.-China relations from a Singapore perspective. One question was about the deployment of 2,000 Marines, U.S. Marines in Darwin. So I told the Chinese, you must expect that at the bedrock, the relationship between Australia and the U.S. is a profound one. You need only visit the War Museum in Canberra to know that it is a relationship watered in blood. 
In the same way, I think China should know that the relationship between Europe and America is a profound one, particularly white America. But America's demographics are changing. And more and more Americans do not resonate as much when they see the Parthenon or when they visit uh, 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 Florence uh, because they have a different history. So American politics will change. But this common basis that what created America was as a daughter civilization of Europe, that is very deep. So China should have no unrealistic expectation that it can ever divide America from Europe. But it can tell the Europe, look, you have different interests, let's work on all your interests, those which are aligned to America and those which are more important for yourself. Take a practical approach and be patient. So I see China as wanting a strong EU. They will support EU autonomy, even in defense, but they know that will take a very long time. And they support a strong euro because they resent the exorbitant privilege which the US dollar enjoys today, which enables the US to have 800 military bases around the world. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, uh, that wraps up our discussion. Can I ask you first to thank George warmly for his very thought-provoking uh, comments today?